March 23rd, 9.30 a.m. I'm going to read chapter 13 of part 3 of book 4 of the banishings and of the purifications. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and had better come first. Purity means singleness. God is one. The wand is not a wand if it has something sticking to it which is not an essential part of itself. If you wish to invoke Venus, you do not succeed if there are traces of Saturn mixed up with it. That is a mere logical commonplace. In magic, one must go farther than this. One finds one's analogy in electricity. If insulation is imperfect, the whole current goes back to Earth. It is useless to plead that in all those miles of wire, there is only one hundredth of an inch unprotected. It is no good building a ship if the water can enter through however small a hole. That first task of the magician in every ceremony is therefore to render his circle absolutely impregnable. See, however, the essay on truth in Conxon Pax. The circle in one aspect asserts duality and emphasizes division. While one remains exposed to the action of all sorts of forces, they more or less counterbalance each other, so that the general equilibrium produced by evolution is on the whole maintained. But if we suppress all but one, its action becomes irresistible. Thus, the pressure of the atmosphere would crush us if we banished that of our bodies and we should crumble to dust if we rebelled successfully against cohesion. A man who is normally an all-round good sport often becomes intolerable when he gets rid of his collection of vices. He is swept into monomania by the spiritual pride which had been previously restrained by counter-prevailing passions. Again, there is a worse draught when an ill-fitting door is closed than when it stands open. It is not as necessary to protect his mother and his cattle from Don Juan as it was the hermits of the Thebaid. If one littlest thought intrude upon the mind of the mystic, his concentration is absolutely destroyed, and his consciousness remains on exactly the same level as the stockbrokers. Even the smallest baby is incompatible with the virginity of its mother. If you leave even a single spirit within the circle, the effect of the conjuration will be entirely absorbed by it. The magician must therefore take the utmost care in the matter of purification, firstly of himself, secondly of his instruments, Thirdly, of the place of working. Ancient magicians recommended a preliminary purification from three days to many months. During this period of training, they took the utmost pains with diet. They avoided animal food, lest the elemental spirit of the animal should get into their atmosphere. They practiced sexual abstinence, lest they should be influenced in any way by the spirit of the wife. Even in regard to the excrements of the body, they were equally careful. In trimming the hair and nails, they ceremonially destroyed the severed portion. Such destruction should be by burning or other means which produces a complete chemical change. In so doing, care should be taken to bless and liberate the native elemental of the thing burnt. This maxim is of universal application. They fasted so that the body itself might destroy anything extraneous to the bare necessity of its existence. They purified the mind by special prayers and consecrations. They avoided the contamination of social intercourse, especially the conjugal kind, and their servitors were disciples specially chosen and consecrated for the work. In modern times, our superior understanding of the essentials of this process enables us to dispense to some extent with its external rigors, but the internal purification must be even more carefully performed. We may eat meat, provided that in so doing we affirm that we eat in order to strengthen us for the special purpose of our proposed invocation. In an Abbey of Thelema we say will before a meal. The formula is as follows. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. What is thy will? It is my will to eat and drink. To what end? That my body may be fortified thereby. To what end? That I may accomplish the great work. Love is the law, love under will. Fall to. This may be adapted as a monologue. One may also add the inquiry, what is the great work? And answer appropriately, when it seems useful to specify the nature of the operation in progress at the time. The point is to seize every occasion of bringing every available force to bear upon the objective of the assault. It does not matter what the force is by any standard of judgment, so long as it plays its proper part in securing the success of the general purpose. Thus, even laziness may be used to increase our indifference to interfering impulses or envy to counteract carelessness. See Liber 175. This is especially true since the forces are destroyed by the process. That is, one destroys a complex which is in itself evil and puts its elements to the one right use. 
By thus avoiding those actions which might excite the comment of our neighbors, we avoid the grave dangers of falling into spiritual pride. We have understood the saying, To the pure all things are pure, and we have learnt how to act up to it. We can analyze the mind far more acutely than could the ancients, and we can, therefore, distinguish the real and right feeling from its imitations. A man may eat meat from self-indulgence or in order to avoid the dangers of asceticism. We must constantly examine ourselves and assure ourselves that every action is really subservient to the one purpose. It is ceremonially desirable to seal and affirm this mental purity by ritual, and accordingly the first operation in any actual ceremony is bathing and robing, with first appropriate words. The bath signifies the removal of all things extraneous or antagonistic to the one thought. The putting on of the robe is the positive side of the same operation. It is the assumption of the frame of mind suitable to that one thought. A similar operation takes place in the preparation of every instrument, as has been seen in the chapter devoted to that subject. In the preparation of the place of working, the same considerations apply. We first remove from that place all objects, and we then put into it those objects and only those objects which are necessary. During many days we occupy ourselves in this process of cleansing and consecration, and this again is confirmed in the actual ceremony. The cleansed and consecrated magician takes his cleansed and consecrated instruments into that cleansed and consecrated place, and there proceeds to repeat that double ceremony in the ceremony itself, which has the same two main parts. The first part of every ceremony is the banishing, the second the invoking. The same formula is repeated in the ceremony of banishing itself, for in the banishing ritual of the pentagram we not only command the demons to depart, but invoke the archangels and their hosts to act as guardians of the circle during the preoccupation with the ceremony proper. See Liber O. In more elaborate ceremonies, it is usual to banish everything by name. See the greater rituals of the pentagram and hexagram. For an example of this practice, see Liber Yod. Each element, each planet, and each sign, perhaps even the Sephiroth themselves, all are removed, including the very one which we wished to invoke, for that force as existing in nature is always impure. But this process being long and wearisome, it is not altogether advisable in actual working. It is usually sufficient to perform a general banishing, and to rely upon the aid of the guardians invoked. Let the banishing therefore be short, but in no wise slurred, for it is useful, as it tends to produce the proper attitude of mind for the invocations. The banishing ritual of the pentagram as now written is the best to use. See Liber 333, Chapter 25. See also the ritual called the Mark of the Beast. Only the four elements are specifically mentioned, but these four elements contain the planets and the signs. The signs and the planets, of course, contain the elements. It is important to remember this fact, as it helps one to grasp what all these terms really mean. None of the 32 paths is a simple idea. Each one is a combination differentiated from the others by its structure and proportions. The chemical elements are similarly constituted, as the critics of magic have at last been compelled to admit. The four elements are tetragrammaton, and tetragrammaton is the universe. This special precaution is, however, necessary. Make it seedingly sure that the ceremony of banishing is effective. Be alert and on your guard. Watch before you pray. The feeling of success in banishing once acquired is unmistakable. At the conclusion, it is usually well to pause for a few moments, and to make sure once more that everything necessary to the ceremony is in its right place. The magician may then proceed to the final consecration of the furniture of the temple, that is, of the special arrangement of that furniture. Every object should have been separately consecrated beforehand. The ritual here in question should summarize the situation, and devote the particular arrangement to its purpose by invoking the appropriate forces. Let it be well remembered that each object is found by the oaths of its original consecration as such. Thus, if a pantacle has been made sacred to Venus, it cannot be used in an operation of Mars. The energy of the exorcist would be taken up in overcoming the opposition of the karma or inertia therein inherent.